everybody. It's Hank Linderman here at Getting Angry. This is Thursday, August 20th. The year is 2020. Here I am in my secure, undisclosed location. Everybody's here. Oh, they're starting to share already. I have to push the magic button. Yes, because when you share, an angel gets their wings. Uh, I thought you'd enjoy seeing that little production view. Here's what y'all normally see is me looking at the camera. And uh, we've got a special guest today. Unfortunately, Dr. Greg. Greg Adams, good Dr. Adams, ask Dr. Greg. He's on trauma duty this week, so he cannot, uh, he can't be here today, but he's coming back Tuesday. So that's great. And in his place, we've got someone actually that I wanted to have with Dr. Greg, and this is John Winkleman. And John uh, is a, a friend, and he uh, has spent much of his career tracking down fraud in Medicare, among other things. So it'll be very interesting to speak with him. Let's take a quick look outside. Here's what it looks like out on the lake, out in the backyard. A little windy, but still just a beautiful day here in Falls of Ruff, Kentucky. Mark Andes is here. Uh, Cindy, Barbara, uh, Robin, Billy's here. Everybody's here. Judy Walker's here. Remember to share. Thanks, Judy. Thank you all for sharing. Okay, well, we got work to do today before we get the fun of talking to um John Winkleman. Before we get the fun of that, we get to uh, we got to, we got to go through some news, right? We got a lot of stories to talk about. The standard one is, of course, how we're doing with the coronavirus, which still is not very very good. We've crossed another grim milestone. Just in one day, we've gone from 175,000 deaths to over 176,000 deaths. So uh, this is just really incredible you know what is uh, what's going on we still have not got this virus under control and uh, no sign of when that's going to happen uh, let's look at the states again this, these are figures are from yesterday and they're from worldometers.info uh, california looks to be back in the lead with the most amount of uh, new cases they've dropped somewhat california is going through a tough time with all the fires uh, i spoke to a friend today who's got a family member who's having to evacuate and their home is in the path of the fires near santa cruz california so this is terrible we're going through it here america and uh, we're clearly not up to the job of dealing with a lot of these emergencies uh, let's look at kentucky once again, almost a duplicate of yesterday, 12 deaths, very sad for those families, and 627 new cases. So we don't have it under control in Kentucky either, which is a terrible thing. Um, I'm going to move on. Uh, we, know how this, we know how this goes. We, you know, as expected, the um, numbers drop right after the weekend. And... Uh, you know, Monday and Tuesday look like they're going to be okay. Wednesday comes back, and then, of course, Wednesday, Thursday, and we're going to see even more tomorrow. So uh, it's like Groundhog Day. I know you all feel the same way. Drives me crazy. We're going to have to go Godzilla on the virus, which means shut her down, pay everybody to stay home. Yes, you know, Republican Congress people are saying they're complaining. What? We're paying people to stay home? Yes, that's what we need to do. That's your job, stay home. We can shut this virus down like Wuhan has, like Australia has, like South, uh, South Korea has, like Germany has, like New Zealand has, like Canada has. We could do it, just takes doing it. Uh, this is a fascinating story. This is the big story today. Steve Bannon, you remember that name, he took over the uh, far right, um, you know, the really pretty extreme right wing uh, website Breitbart. I thought after Breitbart died that that was going to be that, but Steve Bannon came along and took it to new heights and ended up working for President Trump. Well, one of the things he did after he stopped working for Trump, I'm not sure when the uh, crossover was, but he worked with some folks to set up a private effort to raise money for a border wall. And uh, this didn't go so well, apparently. They got uh, they got arrested. Um, you know, let's have a quick look. Uh, I, I can read you some of what uh, 
what uh, from this story. This is from the Washington Post. Federal prosecutors in New York unsealed criminal charges Thursday against Stephen K. Bannon, President Trump's former chief strategist, and three other men they alleged defrauded donors to a massive crowdfunding campaign that claimed to be raising money for construction of a wall. No, Trump's wall along the U.S.-Mexico border. In a news release, prosecutors said Bannon and another organizer, Air Force veteran Brian Colfage, lied when they claimed they would not take any compensation as part of the campaign called We Build the Wall. You can't make this stuff up. You know, they... Anyway, Bannon, prosecutors alleged, received more than $1 million through a nonprofit entity he controlled, sending hundreds of thousands of dollars to Colfage, his partner, while keeping a substantial portion for himself. The campaign, publicly supported by several of the president's allies, raised more than $25 million through hundreds of thousands of donors, the news release states. They allege that Bannon and Colfage, along with two others, uh, Andrew Badalato, great name, Badalato. I'm I'm Andrew Badalato. Great name. And uh, Timothy Shea. I'm going to remember Andrew Badalato. Routed payments from their crowdfunding campaign through the nonprofit into and another shell company, disguising them with fake invoices to keep their personal pay secret. I'm not sure, but I think the technical term for that is uh, fraud. I'm pretty sure. Um, all four were arrested on Thursday and charged with conspiracy to commit wire fraud and money laundering. They were expected to make court, make court appearances later in the day. Bannon, a law enforcement official said, was taken into custody off the coast of Westbrook, Connecticut, while aboard a 150-foot yacht owned by a friend. This gets better. Chinese billionaire Guo Wenggui. Can you see his name? I don't know if you all can see that. Anyway, it's, you'll have to read the Washington Post story. They'll give you some free ones. You don't have to subscribe. They'll give you five or six free stories a month. Who is wanted by authorities in Beijing on charges of fraud, blackmail, and bribery. This official, like others, spoke on the official who, the law enforcement official gave up the details, spoke on condition of anonymity. Another law enforcement official said that Attorney General William P. Barr was briefed about the matter in advance. And apparently President Trump is saying something like, uh, I didn't approve of this project. And, you know, I got away from Steve Bannon. You know, he had some claims about it. Well, of course, at the Washington Post, they have a comment section. Sometimes that's the best part of the article. So this was the from the comments section says, uh, first guy says, I suppose Trump doesn't know him. Next guy says, when Department of Justice officials arrived to arrest Bannon, he was heard saying, pardon me? And the comment underneath says, today's winner. So yes, you win the internet today. I think that's fantastic. You know, um, Steve Bannon actually uh, is also featured on the bulwark. And I talked to you all about the bulwark because the Bulwark is a conservative website. Uh, and these are folks that uh, you might call them never Trumps. I keep telling you all over and over again, you want to check out this website and even sign up their, for their emails. I'm a progressive. I'm a dyed in the wool progressive. And I'm shocked at how much I agree with the Bulwark. So maybe there's not such a big difference between progressives and conservatives. You know, in fact, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the button. Barbara says, I forgot the Trump button. Maybe it should be the Steve Bannon button today. Uh, so um, anyway, I wanted to show you something else. Uh, the Bulwark sent out an email today. They send out emails every day. And, uh, and this is from that section on the email that they sent out. And they were talking about President Obama's speech last night. There was one powerful moment that broke through the Zoom melees. About half through a commanding, a familiar-sounding speech, President Obama turned to the topic of the recently deceased John Lewis. It's worth reading that section in full. You can go to the Bulwark and see this. You can sign up for them. But he starts to talk about John Lewis. And apparently, uh, the very day that... Uh, President Obama was being sworn in, uh, or I'm sorry, the day that President Obama was born, John Lewis was marching into a jail cell trying to end Jim Crow segregation in the South. And the comment is, what we do 
echoes through the generations. Uh, so again, back to the bulwark, this conservative group, this was the text from their email regarding the uh, uh, response to President Obama's speech. So they're commenting, the bulwark is commenting on the speech. This section carried as much beneath the text as in it, the subtle message to the strain of anti-American critics on the left about how injustices of the past were overcome, the sense that with Lewis's death, this primary source memory is soon to be lost for good, and Obama himself has to carry their torch. But there was something much more politically potent there as well. As he listed the indignities and the suffering that these men and women went through and how they kept their integrity through it all, Obama's whole body language shifted. He broke through the wall created by the stream and he was speaking directly to each one of us and slowly he began to seethe seethe at those who had perpetrated these acts seethe that still today black men are facing the same kind of violence but most of all seethe at our entitled and privileged president who doesn't give a shit about the blood these black americans shed for our democracy i'm quoting the bulwark there a president who has sacrificed nothing and no one, a president who besmirched Lewis's legacy, a president who's the torchbearer of these civil rights leaders, tormentors. He's the torchbearer of the tormentors. Our former president indicted the current one and made urgent the need to put him in the dustbin of history in these 242 words without ever having to say his name. It was truly remarkable and i agree it was it was truly remarkable well look uh, I've, I've gone just a little bit long um and lots of great comments today that i can't get to right this second uh we're going to call right now we're going to reach out to you if i can find my phone oh there it is it's over here oops sorry about that like i say i don't have an assistant i'm my own assistant let's call John Winkleman. John, I hope you're ready. Good afternoon, Hank. John Winkleman, how are you? I'm doing terrific, thank you. Hope you know, all is well but where you are. Say that, say that again. I said, I hope all is well where you are. Uh, yes, it is, it really is. I'm gonna show everybody the view outside, which is spectacular. So I'm trapped in as good a place to be trapped, uh, you know, as I could be. I'm a hundred yards from water, and nice. uh, you know, so it's as good as it could be. But I'm still trapped. I'm still stuck here by this virus, and uh, uh, you know what that's about. I certainly do. We have a very handsome picture of you on the screen now that you sent to me. <laughs> I guess it's an old one, but it was, it was a fun trip to Italy. So yeah. Oh, very good. I couldn't tell, uh, I couldn't tell where you were exactly. Um, well, let's talk about, you spent, the thing that's, that caught my ear when we talked one time was that you had done your thesis on single payer healthcare. That's correct. Yes. Way back in the, way back in the seventies when, when every congressional, period had multiple four, five, six proposals for single payer coverage, universal health care, whatever it might have been called in those days. Uh, Senator Ted Kennedy was a leading proponent and he certainly had something every year that he was a senator. And so uh, I took the opportunity since I was very much interested in, in uh, universal coverage back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, to this day, uh, took the opportunity to, to use my time in graduate school to go study four plans that were you know, in, in Congress. I went down from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. every week, listened in the Senate hearings, wrote my thesis, uh, graduated in, and stayed in healthcare. Now, you stayed in healthcare. So it's fascinating that we've been looking at single payer for Decades and decades. Decades and decades. And the AMA back in the 30s was a very strong proponent of single payer coverage, but has since changed their tune. 90 years ago, the AMA was in favor of single yes, payer. Yes, that is correct. That's something I had no idea about. Well, um, 
we're going to get to that. But but one of the things that you and I talked about yesterday is that there is quite a bit of waste in our system, and some of it is, I guess, criminal waste, fraud. That is correct. Yes. So the, the you know, I, I've, I've been a data geek all my life and finally had an opportunity to build a data warehouse for CMS who had the CMS Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They've been collect. They have data out. You know, they have a lot of claims. They spend they spend one point four trillion dollars of federal money on Medicare and Medicaid. The states pay us a significant portion to cover their portion of Medicaid. So a lot of healthcare dollars out there, and the estimates for fraud are anywhere from six to fifteen percent, depending on whose study you look at. If you take the low end of six percent on one point four trillion dollars, that's eight eighty four billion dollars a year in in fraud. So there's a there, fraud, waste, and abuse. It's not to be clear here. It's fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, but fraud is is particularly onerous in that it is criminal, uh, and there are there was no way to fight that fraud prior. To, uh, yeah, I shouldn't say no way. It was limited in their ability to fight fraud uh, prior to the Affordable Care Act because the Social Security legislation that created Medicare said that any willing provider providing any covered service had to be paid by Medicare for that service. At that point, they could then go chase the dollars if they determined they were fraudulent, but it was any willing provider, meaning you enrolled in Medicare, any covered service, meaning it was on the list of services, they had to pay it first. The Affordable Care Act allowed Medicare to actually create a system of program integrity that would allow them to look at claims before they pay them and put them in a little bucket and say, we need to do further investigation. And they were able to find billions and billions of dollars worth of fraud just by looking at the claims before they were paid. One particular instance, they found the Russian mob in New York and Houston filing claims with stolen provider IDs, they uh, provider IDs that they then filed those claims for the most expensive procedures. But because they were now able to look at that, they determined that an ophthalmologist performing knee surgery was probably not actually happening. And they were able to identify a, a set of stolen provider IDs that were being used to file these claims, and they were able to go after the Russian mob in New York and Houston and save billions of dollars before before they had to go try and chase down dollars that were long gone through money laundering. So, so the, that's the system that I helped build in 12 years at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Wow. Uh, well, I'm a little con- I'm a little concerned though. Did those numbers, those percentages of fraud, change? Now it's still, they're still pretty high. The system is still not funded to the degree that it really should be. One of the interesting quirks of the Social Security legislation, which, as I said earlier, funds Medicare, uh, is that all of the dollars that are recovered through program integrity efforts have to go back into the trust fund. They cannot go back into investing in the program integrity functions. The money collected got to go back into the trust fund, which is a good thing. We want the trust fund to be supported. But for every dollar that Medicare spends on fighting fraud, they recover $20. So you would think Congress would look at that and say, holy moly, we need to invest more in this program integrity function because we can actually bring down the fraud, waste, and abuse that occurs in Medicare and Medicaid. But they don't. They have other things they want to spend their money on. Right. Well, the, the, I guess the question is, uh, are there, is there just no appetite for this in Congress? Is this something that Congress is just not interested, or do you think they're not aware? Well, the, Medicare has to report on this regularly. So they're, they are, they're clearly aware. But the desire to invest has in, in this effort just doesn't seem to reach the top of the pile in all of the things that they need to spend money on. And this is pre-COVID. 
even. This is not just now. This has been years and years in the making. I mean, we put this program together. The data warehouse is built in 2005 to support the Part D Medicare Advantage pharmacy program and the need to reconcile those claims. And obviously, we had more and more data going into the system. We were able to go to the program and say, hey, we have a data warehouse. That was done in 2008. So 2005 is when uh, 2006 is when Part D started. 2008 is when we got the data warehouse put together for them to use to fight fraud. And, you know, the Affordable Care Act needed to get passed and other things needed to happen. But fraud, waste and abuse just always seems to be at the bottom of the pile for what to do with Medicare. You know, they spend there's... a fair amount. I'm not, let's not say they don't spend money, but they just don't realize that for when all those statistics say for every dollar you spend, you get 20 back. And you've got 80 plus billion dollars worth of fraud every year. Yeah, maybe you want to invest a little bit more. Maybe. You know, uh, we had the chair of the House Budget Committee here earlier this week, uh, John Yarmouth, who's the congressman from Kentucky's third district. And so at some point, if you want, I'll forward that to him. If if there's a report you can share with me, he probably already knows about this. I think uh, the... House members, even though Democrats are in the majority, they've been passing all sorts of legislation and doing all sorts of things, but it gets ignored in the Senate. And when they ask various members of the administration to testify, very often they're just refused. But uh, at the moment, our government is somewhat dysfunctional, I suppose, would be the polite way to say it. Um, I would be uh, amiss to not let you know that Pam... Uh, my wife has asked, what's the primary source of fraud in Medicare dollars? It's, it's actually, it's actually crooks. It is people stealing provider IDs and beneficiary IDs. And that has been the highest percentage of fraud over the years. Part of the reason that Congress finally got around to okaying the use of new Medicare IDs that do not include the social security number because there was a very systematic way that the letter on the end of your Medicare ID, which was your social security number represented. It was easy to, easy to, to stimulate. I mean, you could try eight letters and file claims and one, eventually one of them would get, would get accepted uh, with that number. And then you've got that number. So it, it's really the mob, you know, it was, it was the Russian mob in, New York and Houston that we found. Uh, it's also crooked doctors. There was a story, I'm trying to remember how many years ago this was, four or five years ago, 60 Minutes did a study, a story on these, this oncologist who was uh, injecting healthy patients with uh, oncology drugs because he told them that they had cancer and they didn't. Uh, he was discovered through a nurse in his office who reported on a Friday to Medicare the fraud that was going on. And over the weekend, the team that I'm very familiar with did their their study, determined that, yes, in fact, this was all false claims. And on Monday, they arrested the guy as he was getting ready to get on a plane and go back to Iran, oh. and where he had a mansion, multiple mansions, paid for with dollars that he's stolen from that's you know stolen is an interesting word it, it's fraud obviously to, to file false claims but they were actual claims for services being provided they just happened to be he happened to be killing patients because he was giving them drugs that they you know cancer drugs are not healthy drugs they're there to kill cells that are bad <laughs> so when you're when you don't have any bad cells guess what they kill <laughs> good cells um yeah, so uh, it's uh, it's that as well. There are bad people who want to cheat the system. That's the way humans are for whatever reason. Uh, but the largest percentage, to answer Pam's question, is truly the mob stealing provider IDs and beneficiary IDs. It's going to be a little harder for them to do that now with the with the new beneficiary IDs, but they'll still find ways to fish. P-H-I-F-H, for information from elders to get that to get those numbers, and they'll start filing claims. People are gullible. You know, we uh, when we talked the other day, I mentioned a friend that um, her dad had wound up in a coma in a some sort of facility in 
Arizona connected to a bunch of machines. And when, when she went to try and get him out of the facility, there were dozens and dozens of other people in the same circumstance. They were in comas, and they rep- each of them represented, I'm guessing, $6,000 a month. Would that sound about right to keep someone in a coma yeah. in a building? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that average? That's reasonable. That's, uh, it depends on where in the country. And right. The rates vary across the country substantially. So in California, it might be 10000 In Nebraska, it might be 4000 well, so the, the point was the the father didn't want to be there uh, and the family didn't want him to be there. And I don't remember what his paperwork was like, but the family felt like this was something fraudulent. And you said to me, if your family runs into something you think is fraudulent, there's a way you can report it if you're going through it with a loved one. And can you explain that process? Yeah, so, so Medicare uh, has a hotline. Uh, that you can call. I believe it's 1-800-MEDICARE. Um, and if worst case is, uh, I did not look that up ahead of time, I apologize. Um, you go to the uh, medicare.gov uh, website, uh, and there are ways to report online as well um, for basically anonymously, if you want. Uh, if you want to give information out, you can do that. But there is a entire a uh, hotline of folks who will write down all this information and share that with the program integrity folks who will then go and do the investigation, looking at claims data, calling up uh, associates, I mean, all sorts of ways that they will do their investigation to determine if what the hospital or the hospice or the long-term care facility is doing to scam the system. That's called, that's part of the abuse portion of fraud, waste, and abuse. That's not necessarily fraud because the patient is receiving care, but it is an abuse of the Medicare system to keep somebody in a hospice situation against, you know, maybe not against their will, against their kid's will, but it, it just in order to keep them alive to make money. Yeah. Yeah. So I, keeping them on a ventilator, whatever the case might be. Yeah. I also have friends that when, um, uh, a family member was in a uh, uh, a hospice sort of care place. Um, the first person to call when there was a problem wasn't a medical person. It was the uh, person who took care of receiving the money. Because as your loved one was getting ready to die, they were concerned about that, and they, they had some ideas of ways they could extend your loved one's life. And the person who called you was the uh, person who handled billing. Right. I mean, that's, they're, they're, they're looking for ways, obviously, every, it's a, you know, it's a for-profit business. They want to make money and they're going to look for ways to make money. Which is, again, what we've talked about. And one of the things we wanted to talk about today is our system right now of healthcare is focused very much on profit and profit to the point that if in, uh, if a provider isn't making enough profit, they might shut a hospital down. And we see that, by the way, in rural Kentucky, we see that a lot. We see hospitals that are closing or consolidating, and folks out in rural Kentucky might have had a half an hour drive to get to a hospital, and now they've got a 45-minute or an hour-long drive to get to a hospital. And uh, so that's that's why, for example, you know, I'm running for Congress here in Kentucky's second district, and I'm in favor of some sort of single payer. I say Medicare for all, but I also have a suspicion we could do better than that. Now, uh, you and I talked yesterday about the French healthcare system, and one of the things I told you about was a concept that they have called solidarity, which means the sicker you get, the less you pay. And the Frenchman who told me about it said, yes, it's absolutely true. My dad had cancer and, uh, you know, we went through a very difficult period of time keeping, uh, you know, for four years, five years of unrelenting and gruesome treatments to keep their dad going. But he said, we never paid a bill. And he said, in France, we think it is barbaric that in the United States, families lose their houses or their life savings because a loved one gets sick. And... I think we're unique in the developed world for that. Is there any yeah. other nation that you're aware of in the developed world um, that where None. you lose your your life savings or your house because someone in your family no. gets no. sick? 
none. Every every other developed country in the in the world has some sort of universal coverage uh, that limits the amount of money that any any of their citizens has to pay for health care. We are we are unique. We've been this way for a long time. It's hard for this is why I've been in this business for forty plus years is because looking for ways the data since I'm a data geek can help streamline how much we spend, which might then motivate our Congress to do something along the lines of every other country in the developed country in the world. Right. We, it's, 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 healthcare should not cost people their jobs. Their, because let's not forget, sometimes a child is sick. Right. And you have to stay home and take care of that child and you lose your job because you've got nobody to take care of your, your kids. There's a whole interaction of, of multiple facets of the labor system as well as the healthcare system and how to make sure that that healthcare doesn't destroy a family. You know, I spoke I, I, to, we can go on and on on that topic, but yes. Oh yeah. No, <laughs> I spoke to it and, and we have, <laughs> and, and I'm sure we will, but I think it's really important for Kentuckians to understand it doesn't have to be this way. You don't, you shouldn't have to lose your house. Now th there's some sort of built in resistance to the idea of universal health care, and I'm going to describe it this way, because uh, I would speak to I speak to Republicans and Democrats. I'm running for Congress, and I talk to them, and I say, "What if you could have health care that cost 40 percent less than what you're paying now?" And I'm including, yes, your taxes would go up, but your insurance would go down. Your out-of-pocket expense for health care would drop by 40 percent, right? And yeah. it would honestly cover all of us. And we've certainly learned now in the time of the pandemic, we can't have any sick people in the United States. So like in New Zealand, they just cover everybody. If you're there legally visiting and you get sick, they'll treat you. If you're not there legally, they'll throw you, you know, they'll stick you on a plane, they'll get you out. So anyway, we legitimately cover everybody, make it easier to use. Meaning when your loved one is in the hospital, you don't have to be on the phone negotiating with an insurance company while your child right. or your wife or your husband or your mother or your father is in the hospital. And then finally, that we get better results, that we live longer, lower rates of disease, lower rates of infant mortality. And, uh, and I would explain this to people and how many times I, I would hear you, some, pe some people would say, well, I don't wanna pay for anyone else. They would literally, that would be their objection. I don't wanna pay for someone else. And I said, this would be 40% less expensive for you. So there's some objection that I don't understand about paying for someone else. And the thing I wanna to say to you, if you're one of those people out there and you just don't wanna pay for somebody else, let's say we had a single payer system and we all pay into it. And if you get, um, if you get really, really sick uh, and you have to have all this treatment, well, you know, you, your family member, you don't get to have to pay another bill, but your family member gets covered. But say your family, nobody gets sick. Everybody lives a real long time. They pay all this money in and then they die. That is the best case. You won the lottery. Everybody else paid the money and they got sick and died earlier. So it is to the benefit to, uh, for us to all look after each other. Um, Robin uh, Rieger says, New Zealand isn't a valid comparison even per capita. It actually is. They're, because they're so small, it's more difficult to run a system with only four and a half, uh, 4.7 million people, which is what New Zealand has. New Zealand has the population of Kentucky, basically, and they have their own healthcare system. And if you're a visitor there, they cover you. If you have an accident, they take care of you. And they're very and proud. And, and Hank, that actually takes place in almost every other country in, in Europe as well. If you get sick there, they take care of you. They just take so, care of you. It's just easier and cheaper. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Now, and, and let's not forget, as far as your conversations with fellow Kentuckians, they are already paying for other people's health care. That's a it's, huge point. You already are paying. You're just paying inefficiently and you're paying way, 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 way too much. Exactly. And you're, pay and you're paying for what they refer to as uncompensated care. A hospital is required by law to provide services to whoever walks through the door. Right. You go into the emergency room, they're required to pay, and if they have no insurance, guess what? Who's paying for that? You are. Yes. It comes out of your tax dollars. Yes. And so they're, they're already paying in many ways yes. for, for other people's care. This should, be, this, should, this should all be about how do we make our system more efficient? How do we get better outcomes? How do we get clinics and hospitals in rural America 
you know, one of the things that I worked on in graduate school was how to subsidize, how to pay for rural clinics in West Virginia, a neighboring state. Uh, and we came up with a, you know, a game plan of subsidy and incentives and reimbursement. But now today, look at it. And that was in 1980. So here we are, 2020, 40 years later, you know, maybe we need a, 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 a an incentive to physicians to work in rural America and pay off their, their medical school debt by working in rural America. Maybe we could send you to years. medical school if you agree to spend a couple of years working in exactly right in, in an underprivileged. It's like, it's like the GI Bill for medical medicine. Yep, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Well, John, thank you so much for being here with us, and I hope you'll come back. This is a fascinating discussion. I really appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to getting you on the phone with Dr. Greg. Um, I don't know when we'll pull that off, but I think that would be fascinating to get the two of you going at once. I think that would be interesting. It would, it, I would look, look forward to it greatly. And, I, and you know, being retired at this time of day works really nicely for me. Oh, very yeah. good. I look, forward, I look forward to it. Okay. All right, thank you. John, Anything. thank you so much. You have a great day. Absolutely. Okay, you take too. care. Bye. Well, everybody, I thought that was really interesting. The, you know, and and uh, Robin, you're correct. Uh, uh, we are cautious of generalizations, and you're going to find, uh, no matter which country you're in, someone complains about their health care. That's just the way it is. But when when you start to look at the overall performance of a healthcare system, you can measure it in terms of what is spent, you know, corrected for different currencies and stuff. What is spent per patient, what is spent as a percentage of your gross domestic product. The United States is at 18% or more of our gross domestic product. By the way, in something like 2003, we were at 13%. We were substantially lower. Uh, New Zealand, France, uh, Canada, a bunch of them are at around 11%. The nation of Taiwan, which recently redid their system, they are at 7%, and they cover every citizen. Um, when you do in terms of absolute, I can tell you about France. They spend about $4,500 a year per person. We spend closer to $9,000 a year. They may spend maybe $4,800. I haven't seen the most recent figures, but the point is they spend a lot less. They live longer. It's easier for them to use, and they cover their guests. When someone comes to France on a trip, they cover them. You know, there's something else I want to address, and that is, you know, the, the Republican Party is in a bit of a bind because um, they have a president who is saying outlandish things. He's screaming in capitalized tweets, you know, racist comments and just really divisive, horrible things. And I think there are possibly some Republicans who are quietly not wanting to admit that they support anything. They're sorry that they voted for President Trump. I need to scream. But there are lots of Republicans that are in the House or in the Senate that still, on the surface, they support President Trump. When President Trump's policies put children in cages, Brett Guthrie didn't say a thing. He didn't say anything about that. How hard is it to stand up to the idea of putting children in cages? When peaceful protesters were thrown out of Lafayette Park for a photo op for the president when moms were tear gassed where were the republicans standing up where was brett guthrie why didn't brett guthrie have the courage to say you know maybe tear gassing moms is a bad idea this past couple of weeks we have seen the post office under assault with a republican contributor a guy who's contributed millions of dollars to republican causes totally partisan guy goes in and starts to take apart the post office an organization, a piece of our federal government that is actually older than the nation. And, you know, it's one thing, you know, if we are going to lose the post office, which would be a complete tragedy, the cities are going to be more or less fine. But out in the country, in rural America, there are a lot of us that that's how we get, that's how we are connected to the rest of the world. We don't have that much broadband out here in rural Kentucky. 30% of the United States does not, have, does not have broadband. So the post office is our closest connection to the federal government. When will Brett Guthrie have the courage to stand up and say, no, you have to leave the post office alone. In fact, it needs to be fully funded. 
This idea of privatizing the post office is a terrible idea. It's unpatriotic. It is un-American. So, Brett, how much courage does it take for you to stand up to things you know are wrong? And if you don't know they're wrong, you and I have some talking to do. Give me a call. All right. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to be here tomorrow. Remember, by the way, big news tomorrow. We're going to be doing it from the campaign page. Oh, and big announcement on Monday, John McPhee from the Doobie Brothers is going to join us for an interview. I think we're going to talk mostly about music, but John McPhee will be here and it will be just fantastic. Uh, as he says, it's going to be great. So remember, tomorrow this will be from the campaign page. I'll put some notices up on the personal page. Uh, Hope we have a great day tomorrow. Uh, oh, let's get a look outside one more time. And uh, thank you all so much. This is getting angry. It means not that you lose your damn mind, you do anything foolish. You use your anger to focus yourself for doing the right thing, for making sure you vote and get other people out to vote. And this year, you need to vote Democrat. All right. Thank you all for being here. You know, I love you. See you tomorrow, 3.30 Eastern, 2.30 Central.